Welcome everyone, Jeff Kanata to Dragon Talk. Yay! Hey! Yay! Oh my gosh, I am so excited to be here. You this feel is the awesome. love? You feel the love of the studio audience? It's incredible. Yeah. There's so many people it's crazy. in this studio audience. Yeah. I know, I'm just packed in here. You're you guys so cool, really. Josh. You're my favorite. <laughs> I loved you on Scandal. <laughs> <laughs> my one Scandal fan. Hey, I, I, I'm going to save that because I got questions. Sweet. Okay. You were on Scandal? I yes. Know. I didn't I did. know that. I did an episode of Scandal, one episode. <laughs> That's all it takes, man. That is yeah. all it takes. Yeah. And that were is you... actually the real reason why you're here. <laughs> <That's right. We're> good. <laughs> well, whatever what? it takes, whatever it takes to get me through the door, you know what I'm saying? What's Kerry Washington really like? Hey, that's one of my questions. <laughs> I got dirt. No, I'm just She was delightful. I will, I will. I was saving that. I couldn't hold it in. I was actually so excited. Shelly's burying the lead. I know. I, I kind of did. I mean, I people listening might know you from Dungeon Room. I hope so. I know you from Scandal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fair enough. I'll might. take it. They're like, oh, the Scandal guy plays D and D. That's cool. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> The scandal guy. That was the top line of all of your bios. Is like, is. You, know, you may know him from Scandal. <laughs> but gosh, you've been doing uh, this type of thing for a long time, right? Yeah. When, when did you start? We started the Totally Rad Show at the beginning of 2007. Wow. We were uh, conceptualizing it in 2006. So it was, yeah, it's a, it's a long time. In the internet years, that's you know, that's even longer because internet years go by faster. We we were doing that show before YouTube, really. Wow. Um, and it was like a video podcast before there were video podcasts, really. There yeah. were very few of them. And um, we figured out how to do green screen before there was like plugins for green screen. It was it was wild west back then. It's it crazy. Amazing being and out, I like... remember that there was um, like, because we, before we started recording we discovered that we do in fact know each other that we have actually worked together because yes uh, it's been lifetimes but yes it is uh sometime like maybe for the fourth edition i don't know if i was involved in that but definitely there was a time in between fourth and fifth when we were at pax and we had this D D bus yeah. that we had wrapped and it was like all retro and it was super cool and it was I know we awesome did, like, it was uh, a full-size beholder you yes! guys had like in the parking yes! lot. Yeah, yep. it was amazing. Yep. I remember I saw a picture of me and standing in front of that somewhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So it took me a minute to make that connection. But yes, yeah. I do remember working with you guys. It's kind of hard to imagine now where D&D &D rules the world and everyone knows it and everyone plays it. But there was a time back then when it was really a niche, a niche of a niche, you know, yeah. and, and, um, we were trying to help get the word out on on D and D. It just, just seems impossible to even fathom that 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 you know it was a smaller community back then. It really has grown, and I love the fact that it has grown. But it's yeah. it's some people don't remember how it's not that long ago. But it was uh, you know it was a different ah. landscape back then. Absolutely. When I when I started doing game journalism stuff uh, around that same time period as you, two thousand six, two thousand seven. It was pulling teeth trying to get yeah. editors and everyone to be like, well, I mean, the audience isn't that big, even though you're really passionate about it. And it was just always this, we're about video games and that's right. what it's all about. And I'm like, but it's so close and there's so much more to talk about and you're not you know, tapping into this audience. And you're right. It was it was a different time. And, and it's so cool to see that transition. Yeah, I agree. It's it's really wild back then. I mean, I think the whole geek universe was was just blossoming at that point you know we we uh for the totally rad show when we were doing that show we won a webby award he said you know casually throwing <laughs> it off uh the but, outlet that i worked for also won the webby award, hey so. all right so webby high five yeah. um yeah. but the re the only reason i brought it up is because the you, when you win a webby you have five words that you're able to get that's their, their gimmick was at least back then i don't even know if that's still true but your acceptance speech is supposed to be five words and um our five words when we won were uh nerd is the new cool and when we said that in 2007, we thought it was like this anthem that was kind of not really true, but we were going to make it true, you know? And then in just a few years, it is undeniably true. And it almost feels pat and trite to say nerd is, nerd is cool because 
obviously all the, the biggest movies, the biggest books, the biggest TV shows, the, everything is nerd culture now, you know? Right. Yeah. It's so much so that it's not even nerd culture. It's right. It's culture. culture. Yes, <laughs> it's just, absolutely. There'll be a time when we tell our kids, you know, back in the day, Greg oh, yeah. used to get made fun of for like in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, that's I what I would, I would say nerd. I was a nerd when nerd meant nerd, you right. know? Yeah. I would Do hide my Dragonlance novels. I would be reading them. Oh. And my, my mom would walk in. I'd be like, ooh, got to put those down. Like it was yeah. salacious. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's there, hard to, there was it's, a dragon on the cover? There was a dragon. <laughs> and, and maybe a, a, a bikini. With oh. some and a dragon in a bikini is, is you know, even worse. That's the you know? world. <laughs> you can't. But you've been playing D&D for a long time, yes? I have, actually. I... You know, in the same thing we've been talking about where, you know, being an actual nerd when when it meant you were super uncool as a kid, I didn't actually have enough friends to play D&D. I literally had too few friends. <laughs> I always <laughs> wanted to play D&D as a kid. I was fantasized about it. I always looked at the books and like, you know, thought about it, but I j just physically couldn't assemble enough human beings <laughs> to do it. Um, so I never played until I was grown up. Um, but it was right around that same time. In fact, we're talking about the Totally Rad show. The way we met, Alex Albrecht, Dan Trachtenberg, and I, the way we met was playing, all three of us playing our first game of D&D together. Oh. Uh, it was a game of D&D that was put together for adults that had never played before. And we all met around the table and became friends and then started the show after that. So, really? That, yeah, that was around the same time, around 2006. And uh, I've basically been playing after that. And Pretty soon after that, I transitioned to DMing and, um, but yeah, I, I, I guess that's a long time, but to me, it felt like not a long time because I didn't do it when I was a kid, when I wanted to be, you know? Yeah. Do you yeah. feel like if they, if you guys were assembled around like just a table at a bar and you met that way, that you would have formed as much of a bond as you did because you were assembled around a table playing D&D? Boy, that's a great question. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I feel like Dan Trachtenberg always says um, that when he met the two of us, it was like meeting your people. Mm. You know, you, have, you know that feeling when you meet people sometimes and you're like, oh, oh yeah. I know that person. I, I can be friends with them. And then there are other people you meet who are like, we are of the same blood. You know, yeah. we, we breathe the same air. And I, I kind of feel like that may have happened regardless of the context. But I think we got insight into each other's kinship because we were doing this thing that felt so personal and so important to us. Because you rolled really high on your insight check. With yes. Him. That's right. You got you to gotta nail those insight checks. There you go. Sometimes I see like a drunk mom ignoring her child and I'm like, you're my baby. <laughs> I, I totally like get, I get what you're saying. And I'm like, some of my best friends are yeah. are apathetic drunk mothers. <laughs> you just walk over and you <laughs> fist bump and you go, "We're the same." Yes, Cheers. We're the same. Yeah, right. yes, we are of the same. No, I I always just feel like like D and D friendships are really strong friendships, even if you play just you know once with like a really intense D and D game together. Yeah. Like I will always hold those people kind of close. In my heart because well i tell you you know that has been the experience of doing the dungeon run which is the live play show that we do now it it, it was assembled i didn't know any of the other players Ooh, at the table before we started and now i feel like they're some of my closest friends i feel very close to them and we all really genuinely have affection for one another and that is an in, a, a, a relationship that is entirely based on playing together so i think that you're absolutely right so that's interesting. The group was what what was the like criteria for a, assembling this group? Because it does feel like you guys gel really well together. Even from that very first episode, you would not have I would not have known that you not all played together before. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I, it was a show that was cast. It was um, it was a breakdown put out in the trades in L.A. and we auditioned Are you actors. Serious? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was a cast show. So it was really assembled by producers and with me involved as well um because i was hired on as the dungeon master before we got the cast and then they had me assist in the casting process i ran okay. a, a short scenario for a bunch of people which was a very wild experience but 
Um, we, and then we, you know, brought those people together and swapped in and out and just formed what we felt was the strongest group of players. Um, so it was all strangers to each other, to me, wow. uh, to the producers. But I think in that casting process, we really honed in on not just good players, not just good performers, but really good people as well. Yeah. And so it became easy to become friends with them and really like them because they're just all such fantastic human beings, um, which is nice to have. That's good for yeah, anybody so who's interviewing anybody for any job is like, find good people that you want right. to interact with a lot. If you want, would you want to save this person's life? Would you give <laughs> hit points for this person? Exactly. Yeah, it's, that's that's a requirement in this particular job for sure. So yeah. were did everybody or most of the people who who came to the casting call, were they experienced D&D players or were they just like, eh, I can, I'm an actor, I'll fake it? Most, of the, the by far the most uh, the highest percentage of people were experienced ones. That was kind of the breakdown when you put out a breakdown in LA and you're hiring actors, you put a little description. And one of the descriptions was looking for people who have had experience playing tabletop, role-playing games, Dungeons okay. and Dragons in particular. Um, so we kind of already got that. There was a few people that hadn't played ever. In fact, one of the people in our cast, Katie Michaels, uh, never really played. Uh, she has had experience with it. Her husband uh, played a lot. Uh, before she got on so she kind of had learned a little bit of the ropes being around that but she hadn't played extensively until being on the show and it's one of the things that i love about having her on the show is that she thinks about the game in a very different way than everybody else yeah. she doesn't think about she doesn't have the baggage of years and years of knowing the rules like she just sort of previous editions yes and yeah. It's just very free and uh, she comes up with these really wonderful outside the box ideas and we, you know, work with it. It's wonderful. And she's become a very skilled player very, very fast. She's a smart, awesome person. But um, it's so cool having, we have a variety of experience levels at the table. We have very experienced people who've DM'd and been playing for years and years and years and all versions of the game, uh, all the way up to, you know, a neophyte who, and, and I feel like that's a wonderful way in for the audience too, is you get yeah. to have this person that's, if you've never played D&D, &D, maybe you relate to her and her experience and see how anybody can play this game. You know, it's it's really one of those things that I think people feel like is going to be a hard thing or there's going to be lots of math or it's going to be intimidating. And the truth is anyone can play it. All you need is an imagination. Yes. And now yes. a webcam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now you need well, thousands like of that. dollars of equipment, an ISP. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it's a very low barrier. <laughs> yeah. Very low. Yeah. Uh, but that, I mean, you guys started out with a lot of uh, very high production value for Dungeon Run with, you know, the, the sets oh. look amazing, the lighting, yeah. you know. The mind flare. Your animatronic mind flare. Yeah. Love. We now have our animatronic mind flare puppet on a webcam from his house. Uh, still zooming in and uh, and talking with everybody. So the 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 puppet is still a big part of the show. But yeah, we're I'm very proud of the the whole idea behind the dungeon run was like, what if your our dream version of Dungeons and Dragons? We, what if we got to make that? You know, what if we got to have the coolest sets and props and production and and if we, what if we could shoot it like a TV show with a big you know boom arm and a jib and moving around, getting awesome shots and multiple locations and this animatronic puppet that could host the show. So it really was this dream project for me to be a part of. And now that we're in, you know, work from home situation, the production team has also gone really far in figuring out ways to still make the show feel special and up the production value. We've now, we have a virtual version of our set with a virtual version of our table that has virtual minis on it and maps and they're moved around and animated. It's wow. incredible what they've managed to do. It's all custom. It's none of it's off the shelf stuff. It's all made by the production team. So they're still, you know, even with the limitations of having to work from home, they're still really going, you know, 110% with it. That's that's amazing. Cause it's, it's yeah. not like anyone could have seen this coming and they had a contingency plan. <laughs> well, they didn't. I mean, it's just a bunch of scrambling on the fly. I mean, we, yeah. we um, we found out that this was all, I mean, I, I remember actually the Wednesday, we do the show on Wednesday nights. The Wednesday night of our last uh, show in the studio was the night while we were doing the show, while we were playing Dungeons and Dragons, the announcement that the NBA was canceling its season happened. Oh, wow. 
And I remember I, every night when we record the show at intermission, I call my wife and say goodnight to my kids. And I called and she goes, they just canceled the NBA season. And I went, oh no, <laughs> this is real. <laughs> this is that's a, yeah. real. That's a big thing. And so we all finished the show and went, is this the last time we're going to be in here for a while? And we thought, Maybe a couple weeks, three right. tops, you know, we'll, we'll be back. And so we did a one episode where we were just sort of, we did a watch along episode as kind of like a stall. And then it became clear that this was going to have to be our new normal. And the production team just like leapt into action, problem solved. And really every week it's gotten more and more sophisticated, more and more visually appealing. And I just got off a call a couple hours ago with the production team and they they have even more ideas of how it's going to improve in the next couple of weeks. So it's, yeah, it's cool. That is, what, that's really cool. What do yeah. you think about, I mean, you know, it's that, uh, what you're describing is very different than, you know, people getting together and rolling dice. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of accessories. I mean, you've got my little set back here that I was putting together. Um, yeah. You know, th those all add things to it. But at its core, you know, this the, the game's about, as you said, imagination and and, and interaction between people. Yep. Um, do you do you ever get worried that the the... Uh, amount of stuff that the production folks are putting into it is uh, is not the same as as the way other people play it, or you know, you're saying it's a heightened version. Like, how how do you make sure that you stay consistent to uh, the storytelling being the focus, and then these things just being additive? I think that one of the wonderful things about our players is that they are all very concerned with telling a great story, and it is it is a storytelling tool, Dungeons and Dragons. I I think that's ultimately at its heart, what it is. It, it is a game. It is a game where you you do fun things and you, you you know try to win, I guess. But for me, I've always thought of Dungeons & Dragons as a storytelling medium. And every one of the people that is involved, from the players, to me, to the production staff, to the crew, every single person that is involved in this show, to the music people that are making the music live, they score the show live, it, every one of them is trying to tell the coolest, most interesting, deepest story. And that is where we start. Like all of the crazy production value and virtual sets and all the stuff that gets layered on top of that, the goal is to serve the story, to make the story more interesting, more fun. The idea behind having an animatronic Mind Flayer host to host the show came from, hey, how do we take the hosting duties off of the DM so the DM doesn't have to be the host of the show and the right. DM. How, do, how can we let the DM just focus on creating the best show possible and not have to worry about all of the interacting with the live audience and all that stuff? So literally all of these decisions come from how do we tell the best story? How do we create the most immersive, coolest fantasy epic we can? And I think that, you know, having a really amazing mini when or a, um, a model come out, you know, when we were in the live environment and we have these, I mean, we have these Hollywood prop makers create incredible meetings. We had a, a full animatronic Kraken that they fought under one, this incredible underwater model, um, all custom made. That moment is, yeah, a whiz bang, wow, gee whiz, look at how cool the model is. But it created a moment of drama for the players, right? It created this moment of storytelling in the context of Dungeons and Dragons, because they, we left the stage, they brought the model out, everything was dark, they came back out, I described what they saw in their imaginations, and then the lights came up and they saw it in real life and they went, oh, I'm transported to this place, right? I'm able to tell this story. Oh, can I move my character around here under this tentacle? It is all trying to create as cool and fun a storytelling experience as we can. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> that makes total and sense. Cut. Uh, I had a really good question uh, come in on Twitter uh, from uh, Robin Harney, and uh, they asked, uh, "How do you keep?" And this is something that I battle with as a dungeon master uh, and fail more often than not. Uh, but how do you keep track of NPCs uh, and create different voices for them, and then try to recall them, even <laughs> when you may not even be prepped to do so? Yeah, you know, we have a we have a warlock in the party who's constantly casting sending to old characters that haven't been in the show for a while. And I'm like, breaking my brain trying to remember the voice. Um, but it, it, I describe it 
actually Ron Ogden on our show described it, and I keep stealing this from him and, and repeating it because I think it's perfect. Um, people talk, uh, people who do like competitive memory stuff where you're trying to memorize decks of cards in random order or whatever, they talk about creating a mind palace. You guys ever heard of that? Creating a I, I mind have, palace? But, but explain it. Uh, the idea is that we as human beings remember things better when we create narratives, when we see things in our imagination and you walk, so you're memorizing a deck of cards and it's like the queen of hearts and then a, two, a deuce and then a three, you go, okay, I saw the queen and she, you know, she, I was gonna say taking a deuce, but that's terrible. Uh, she's- <laughs> Not on this show, that's actually- <laughs> Right. So on brand. <laughs> you, you walk yourself through a place. You're like, okay, the queen is over here in a portrait in the room in the mind palace. And then you walk down the hall and there's a whole room of twos, the number two all over the place. And then, oh, there were three crazy clowns that walked through the door. So because we have a hard time as human beings remembering random numbers, what we can remember are stories and crazy, the wilder the thing, the better. So three clowns, you'll always remember, okay, after the room of twos all over it, I walked into the room that had three crazy clowns. And then, so that's how these competitive memory people remember things very quickly. I think that is basically the job of the DM. Mm. You are just assembling a palace in your mind of all of the things your players are going to experience. So if they're gonna walk into a, you know, a, a a cave, you, at least this is how I prep for a, a game. I imagine the cave and I imagine, and I think about where we go and what, who we encounter and what's in that corner and what's on the ceiling and how does the floor look and what does it smell like? And what is, what is the, what are the sounds? And I try to just build my imagination as vividly as possible so that invariably when some player says, Hey, what's over there? I have thought about it. And I can just tell them instead of, you know, sometimes you have to pull things out of your butt on the fly, but that I think is the job. And so I think the same thing is true with NPC voices is that I try to create a voice for the character that comes from a place that is the essence of the character in some way. So I place it in a, in a place in my mouth or whatever, uh, in an accent that uh, makes sense for who that character is. So when, someone says, hey, I want to talk to this character or a character shows up that you didn't expect to show up. You're thinking along the lines of the narrative anyway. You're going, oh, they're meeting that person who is a swarthy pirate. So are they a swarthy pirate? You know, so it becomes, it makes sense to just do that, that thing. Mm. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but that's, that's the process that I do. Yeah, it's interesting. Do, I mean, do, uh, do you actually have in your, in your mind palace? You're like, okay, that's that NPC, that NPC. And so that you can kind of really yeah. quickly just go to it. And then you're like, and I right. have, I have trigger phrases for some of the, the NPCs, right? I have a, a thing that I can repeat in my head when Morgan Peter Brown says, Hey, I want to cast sending to this crazy character that I, that hasn't been in the show for six weeks. But we talked to, you know, way, way back then in the different continent we were on. I go, okay, that the, the trigger phrase for that character was this, this. And so I say it in my head and I hear myself saying it in my head before I start to speak. Yeah. And I do things like um, stall for time, you know, by describing the magic effect of sending. And in my head, I'm going, what does the character sound like? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's galaxy brain right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. th that's really interesting because I, you know, when I was started asking that question and thinking about how I've had success with that in the past, I always think of um, there's this old George Carlin album where he's talking about everybody in his era was doing uh, Ed Sullivan impressions. Right. And he's like, and he breaks down really quickly where he's like, well, for me, that my Ed Sullivan is keyed by this phrase, and well, now you know, or and he does, and he does that. Right. that I'm doing it badly, <laughs> but it was George Carlin basically in the midst of his act, just saying like, that's how I get into that voice. And then I can do all the voices after that. I just have to repeat that thing. Right. Um, and when I've had uh, uh, NPCs that I've been voicing in the past uh, have a, a distinct sound or, or whatever um, it has always come from, from a single phrase that I, okay, I know this one and I can go back to it. And it is uh, a really good, uh, good tool. And I think more people if you start to, rather than just yeah. doing it on the fly and improvising it, but having a list of being like, all right, here's my catchphrases for all right. of the uh, the things and you know, all the NPCs that I've done over the years. And then you can v quickly go back to them in this. I'll give hours. you an even, uh, even more refined tip for that. At least for me, what is useful is having their trigger phrase be their name. 
Ooh. <laughs> so oh, oftentimes, yeah. you know, like I have this character, Torvald the Timid, and my, and my trigger phrase for Torvald the Timid is Torvald the Timid. I'm Torvald the Timid. You know, so I hear my, I hear him say, I'm Torvald the Timid, Torvald the Wires. You know, and so it, <laughs> it becomes like that's, it's even simpler when it's their own the name and you name. go, oh, yeah. okay, you want to talk to Torvald? That's how he's, you know, that's how he sounds. That's smart. Can you, can you do your white beard voice? Somebody in chat wants to hear it. White beard, a pirate white beard. White beard is basically, um, um, oh God, what's his name? Um, Jack Palance from Batman. Where he says, ah, oh, you're my number one guy. You know, that's, that's, that's white beard. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, so back to the um, assembly of the group, the, how did you, as the dungeon master, I'm going to assume this was part of your role, but this is all, they, they, they don't know each other either, right? And they had not right. played D&D together. But how did you get, did you employ any tactics to like make this group gel quickly or to like kind of make them more comfortable with each other? Uh, did well, take, work? Or, or, or an Asuka together or something like that? <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we drug tripped for weeks. <laughs> And then we that killed, works, man. And then we entered the mind palace together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> entered my mind palace. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, it, we it was a very compressed process because uh, it was all happening super fast. Um, we were fortunate that we, like I said, cast really, really well. So the the cast themselves were all actors. They understood the need for camaraderie among themselves. And they started like meeting and hanging out for lunch or having a dinner together in the like couple of weeks oh, that they cool. had between getting cast and when we started. So they were already understanding the importance of having a familiarity and, and knowledge of each other. So they started that process. We all had a, a couple of dinners together um, and we had a couple of meetings. I had individual meetings with them one-on-one -on -one where we just talked through their their character backstories. And, and then I tried to, my whole goal with this show is to really incorporate character backstory into the fundamental mainline storyline. Yeah. So we talked a lot about their characters one-on-one -on -one, and then we had group sessions and then we had a session zero, which I think is really helpful. Um, that was, it was the, the beginning of the, of the big adventure. Uh, a lot of the viewers of our show are very frustrated that we never recorded that because it, oh, yeah, it is something ask. that keeps coming up over, over and over again. But it was the first time that the characters had met each other. And we did that privately where there was plenty of opportunity to fail and, and be terrible and not perform for a camera or anything and just sort of have fun playing D&D &D together. It, it was also a tech rehearsal for the production crew. So it was a little chaotic and crazy and Another side story I don't need to get into. I also threw up that night because I had <gasps> eaten badly. But it was a it was a wild experience. But ultimately, it uh, it gelled the cast, and I think we were all shocked at how well episode one came together. That said, I feel like episode one is the worst episode we did. I feel you know I think it's a good episode, but it's nowhere near as good as the show gets. And so sometimes yeah. when people watch episode one, I'm like can you get to episode three? <laughs> you know, like keep going. But I do think episode one is still good. I mean, that happens yeah. in a lot of creative endeavors, right? Where yeah. like the first preview of a, of a play, you're like, well, it's not really opening. It's right. not the best you're going to get, you know? Yeah. And same thing with a pilot where it can be a very right. good pilot, but you know, sometimes episode two is the worst one because it's like yeah. the first time they're getting into a, a, a schedule and stuff like that. So totally, totally understand. And, and it, there's also the, all that fun stuff. I, I think, we as creators don't always think about this, but that warts and all is what sometimes the super fans crave. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. And we have the most incredible community around Dungeon Run already. They're just so, such wonderful people. We have this fantastic discord. We had a, just had our one year anniversary a couple of weeks ago and the community came together and like made this video for us and did a big Aww. long two hour live stream. We didn't organize any of it. They built it together. They made a book that chronicled each episode and had fan art for everything. It was incredible. We were all crying that whole day. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's 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 awesome. So yeah, you're right. The the I think I think one of the magic things about streamed Dungeons and Dragons that you wouldn't have been able to convince anyone in 2007 <laughs> is that people like seeing the messiness and the rough around the edges of improvising your way through a story. It, yeah. it is, 
I think it's wonderful to watch, especially the cast that I'm part of, um, watch them find it and, and, you know, try things and experiment and, and be honest. And it, it's, it's a cool thing to watch a, a story that holds together, that feels cinematic, that has high adventure and really emotional moments all happen live, improvised, unplanned, reactionary. It's, it's, it's magic. It is magical. It really is. Um, and I, I wonder what, this is something that's been toying with me for a while is how has this affected the games that you play not on camera? Like, have you, is, is it hard to do that? Is it hard to go back and just be like, Hey, this is just for shits and giggles now, uh, you know, just amongst us or, you know, or, or like, Oh man, I don't want to think about a whole other game now because all of my D and D muscles are exhausted from just doing this on a, on a weekly basis. You know, how, how have you yeah. been able to do that or have you at all? No, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I do think it has changed me. I don't, I don't, it's hard for me to even understand people that can DM multiple games at once. Mm -hmm. it, it, it feels like such an all consuming endeavor for me. Even when I wasn't doing it as a streaming show, it was just like, you know, building this mind balance. It's like all consuming. <laughs> it takes, it takes a lot of time and energy. And I really try to, you know, I really try to have breadth and depth in, in the game world for, for my players. So being able to do it for multiple games it has always felt like this Herculean task that I'm impressed other people can do. Um, but I do think that there is something that we have gained in the dungeon run, especially with the audience interaction that we have and the the way that the the way that the community has rallied around the show. It, it's it makes it better. And going back to just you know in my living room games, there's something that you can do in living room games that you can't do on streamed games. And that is like break things and just go crazy and riff on a goofy thing in, in a really bizarre way for a long, long time. And I love that stuff too. I mean, we, I wouldn't do that in a, I wouldn't be willing to risk the structural integrity of, of a long-term show in that way. And, but in a living room, you can be like, yeah, okay. You know, you're inside out. Now you're inside out for the next three hours, you know, let's figure out how, how, how do you behave when you're inside out? You know, whatever it is. Um, but, but I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I love, I love playing the game in my living room because of that freedom, but I also really cherish the layer of people watching and high stakes and feeling like every moment has to be really wonderful. And because it's not just for us, it's for other people too. Yeah. I had a similar question to what greg just asked you about your dming style and how like how do dms have to what do they have to do when they're playing you know for an audience versus just playing in their living room and I mean, you kind of touched on that a little bit if there's like like you greg and i had a conversation during the, the banter part about like playing live versus playing just at home and how you've well, I guess yours just not live. You do have no. It's live. Yeah, it is live. I thought you. Oh, it's so like you stream on <laughs> caffeine. Yeah, that's the service. It's a oh, it live is stream. streaming okay. service. So when you um, like I, I felt like if I had played in a game last week that was live, and I was telling Greg that I was I had all these insecurities. Like I felt like I was talking too much, <laughs> and and more than I would in just like a regular game because I would. I'm totally fine with silence while we all pause and think about what we're going to do. Or <laughs> right. I, I try to remember like if I have actually used all my spell slots or whatever. Um, and you don't really have that Liberty when you're, when people are watching you. Yeah. Um, and so I've kept feeling like uh, I, maybe I'm talking too much. Like maybe they're the other people are like, oh, shut up lady. Like, cause I had never played with these people before either. So it wasn't like we knew each other's stuff. Right. Well, I doubt so, that's true, but I, you know, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, like, how do you like what, what is like the like helpful things for for that like when you you don't know each other you well or you're not familiar with each other's social cues and you're is it okay to have those pauses should somebody sure. just keep talking like what do you do how do you curb that I think that's a I think again I think that's a great question I I one of the things I can only speak for myself. I don't want to impose my view on other streaming DMs because I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of wonderful things online. 
and that's great. But one of the things that I impose on myself that I think is extremely important because of how I like to consume stuff like this, because I'm also a fan of this right. stuff, you know, um, is pacing. And I think kind of it's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is the strength of our players is that they are all actors and improv actors as well. And there's a, an instinct that I really try to instill in myself and them and the show overall. And that is having an episode of our show feel like an episode of tele, uh, television is maybe not the right word, but an episode of story, right? So it has variety, it has scenes. And if we're in a scene, making it, the scene about something and necessary. So if you feel like someone writing a script for a television show or a movie, the process of writing a scene for a television show or a movie is you go, what, is need, what needs to happen here and why does it need to be in my movie? Right? Why do we have to see this scene? Why would I just not edit this scene out? There has to be a reason why we're here. And I really try to make that the case in D and D scenes, it's hard because we're improvising, right? But structuring and, and having the actors understand that if we're just rehashing the same information over again, or we're overstaying our welcome, or we're we're just trying to, there's not a purpose to what we're doing. There's it's fine to pause and think and reflect and uh, work out something if there's a reason to be there. If your characters are also pausing and thinking and reflecting, but I find that sometimes, um, you know, in a, in a living room situation, you could meander longer and let people just kind of goof around and get some chips and beverage and figure out what's going on. Whereas in a streamed game, you really want it to feel like we are here for a reason. And when, and this interaction is required, it, we need to see it. Uh, and that's a tricky thing to do improvising, but our team is, extremely good at it. I'm very proud of that fact. And I'm very proud of structuring the episodes the way we do and finding ways to create cliffhangers, to create attention points, and to create variety in uh, big high tension moments, low tension moments, fast, exciting action things, slower uh, emotional moments. It, it's trying to sculpt good storytelling while you're improvising. And it's it's a it's a skill that you learn, and I think it's also something that, you know, the way you described it is sort of like feeling insecure about it. I, I don't think that that is necessary. I'm not trying to say that that's necessary, but I also feel like as as you get more comfortable with the players that you're playing with, some of the sometimes those things happen in a really beautiful way, and you go, oh, we're here because of this reason, and now we need to jump out of this. And our players have this cool ability to like know when we need a comedic shift because things have gotten too serious for too long or whatever. Um, but now I'm the one who's talking too long, but I, 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 I find that to be very important and something that I'm very proud of. Have you ever, I mean, so just following up from that, have you ever been like, hey, this scene that we're in that I planned just isn't going the way that we that we wanted and it's not, it doesn't have any stakes. Let's just shift tracks. Like a hundred percent. We do that all the time. We will pull the ripcord on a scene, but do it in a way. It's not like, okay, well, this scene is over. It's, it is, like I said, there are w ways where the actors will come in and go, you know, and say, change gears and do something else. Or we'll have a scene between two characters that are bedding down in the campsite and two characters that are on watch. And the two characters bedding down in the campsite are having a discussion and the discussion kind of runs its course. And so the other two characters understand right. that it's their time to come in and literally cut camera to this other scene like you would in a film. Yeah. Uh, and that's, the, I think that's the skill that you learn is to go, just like you would in an improv show. If you went to an improv show and they had a scene, another actor will come out and edit that scene and transition to another scene. That's how we play Dungeons and Dragons too, is we try to create these moments and scenes. I love that, I love that. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago about the audience interaction. I think the way that you guys have handled it is in a way that's uh, really meaningful, you know? And I don't know if that's always been the case when that's been tried from, from in, in different ways and that's something that, you know, we at Dungeons & Dragons sometimes struggle with so we're just like, ah, screw it, you know? <laughs> it's too hard to try to make it feel real, but you guys have done a really great job of it. So how well, how thanks. would you, um, you know, give any advice or, 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 or talk through that section and, you know, did you guys have a lot of discussions as you were leading up in pre-prod about how to make that happen? 
Oh, yeah, pre prod as the show. Oh no. Jeff froze. Oh no. It wasn't just you, Shelley. It's, it's, oh, it's everyone. I hope We're it's under my, a weird spell today. I hope it's not my internet. It could be. I told. I asked my daughters to be like, "No, you can't stream video well, right now." I, while this I is can happening. hear. I can hear Quinn playing Fortnite. So, as you can see, <gasps> what? everybody really listens to me. I'm gonna blame. I'm gonna blame him. Uh, and here is the, us trying to to fill time as we describe the magical like effect of sending and freeze. Like, brr, brr. I will cast unfreeze. <laughs> Let it go. Unfreeze. Let it go. Uh, I've used all of my spell slots. Unfreeze. No. Unfreeze. That's that's the somatic component is not working. Oh, oh no. He's go. I oops, I cast disappear. Oh, no, wait, <laughs> that didn't work either. I'm sorry. Why is that? No, that? I haven't gotten to my scandal questions. Oh, We've no, got to bring him back. There we go. It's you're not Kate Welch, but at least you look uh uh, not cut in half right now. What? Uh, What's hi. happening? Hi, Kate. How are you doing? I have the uh, random oh. character generator was the only uh, thing that could come up that was not uh, our <sighs> images halfway done on each thing. God, what were There's... you going to ask him about Scandal? Now I want to know. Oh, I don't... I mean... How can you not ask about Kerry Washington? I Hello. I was going to be like, is that real red wine she's drinking? Or white wine? I think was so. it white wine? She always had like white clothing on too. Yes. She was always sloshing around those big old wine glasses. And oh. eating popcorn. Yep. I love Olivia. Thing. I love her so much. Uh, I didn't watch that show as much, but I do remember walking by uh, when Aaron was watching it. And it was every single, every single episode, there was wine and popcorn. Always. <laughs> oh, what's that? <laughs> All right, we are uh, going to try and finish this up with Jeff uh, soon. Uh, give us a second while we try to get him back into the Zoom call. All right, we'll make this yeah. we'll make this happen at least to get a, a good goodbye in here. What do you say to that, puppy? <laughs> puppy says Woof. that he will take on the role of Jeff. Oh, okay. Uh, so, Jeff, a, how did you come up with meaningful life? audience interaction <laughs> with the? Oh, you did that. Well, you don't have to. Oh. Okay. 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 Thanks. Good job. Good job. Good protect. <laughs> uh, okay. Give us oh. give us two seconds, and uh, we'll be we'll be back to finish this up. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to. I haven't used this in a while, but here's our BRB screen.
Hey, we're back. Hi, everybody. Oh, we got hello. Most things scary. figured out. Jeff, you had her power go out. I did. My entire house just went out of power. Uh, but we're back. So, yay. <laughs> uh, Sorry about that, everybody. Dungeon mastery thing to do. That was like really good storytelling right there. <laughs> the dramatic pause. I hope ah, I. Ah, cliffhanger. Yeah. We try well, to um, use your, your skills of, uh, uh, you know, covering with a uh, description of the magical effect that you were under. <laughs> <laughs> that's right exactly yeah uh okay cool but so we were asking about uh audience interaction and how you guys figured out and designed how to incorporate that with the uh kind of overall format of the show right yes uh and it wasn't just pre-production as as the show was live and we were doing episodes we were continually evolving it and i think one of the things that i love most about working with this production company uh, with caffeine is um, how willing they are to continue to iterate and just try to find the best version. Even if we did it a little bit different last week, we'll try something new this week and see how we can improve and improve and improve. And what we have come to, uh, and I'll be honest, I'll be super honest. I wasn't sure that layering on the audience interaction to Dungeons and Dragons, which is a very well-designed, balanced game, uh, it, if it would break it, you know, if it would be a bad idea in the first place. But ultimately what has happened, it has, it has become so much fun. And so there's so many wonderful ideas and story moments that have grown completely out of the audience doing something, the audience interacting with the show that I have fallen completely in love with it. And I'm so glad that all my protestations of like, I don't know if we should do this. It's going to be bad. It were ignored <laughs> because, uh, we have had these incredible story moments. In fact, I'll tell you, you know, when we transitioned into working at home, uh, the idea was that we thought maybe it would just be a couple of weeks or whatever. So we thought, hey, well, let's do this kind of side adventure while we're working at home. And then we'll get back to the main adventure when we're back in the studio. And so I decided, well, we'll do, you know, we'll do a, a, a side story. We'll go back in time and we'll find some backstory fun stuff that we can explore. And the idea, the entire premise of this side story, which has now grown into, I think we just did our ninth episode, uh, ha it was from the audience. It was an idea that they submitted. We do these, these cards that uh, viewers can purchase and give to players. And they're sort of like rule breakers. They're little fun um, story moments or things that the players can use or, or do uh, that let them do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do. And one of the cards that someone submitted was you you found information for an incredible treasure that's that's locked away in one of these four locations. Roll a D4 and find out which location. And the player rolled a D4 and it turned out it was this vault in a city that we've been to. And so the whole story that we're doing now, because that was so inspiring to me, it was an idea that I did not come up with, it was so inspiring we're doing this entire backstory, finding out how this treasure got put in this in this vault and what the treasure is. Mm. So it's like it completely spawned from an audience member coming up with that idea, another audience oh. member buying that card and giving it to a player. It, it's all, and, and that's just one example of many, many, many examples. There is entire characters. One of the deities in our world was invented and named by the audience as a group because they saw one of our production staff coming on and doing things, uh, lighting these candles on our set. And they started calling her the candle queen. <laughs> so I went, okay, the candle queen is a God in our world. Let's just do, go, let's go with that. So it's become this wonderful collaborative thing with the audience. And I find it to be so much fun, such an infusion of great ideas and, and cool concepts that I would never have come up with, but I think make the show better. That's so well, the cool. audience comes up with these ideas. Yeah, we have and cards and stuff. Yeah, the, the cards are 100% audience submitted. They're, they're, mm -hmm. The ideas are, you can log into our website and write up ideas and we get hundreds and hundreds of them. And then I go through and edit all of them and select which ones will make it into the show. And then okay. other viewers of the show will purchase those cards and give them to the, give them to the players, award them to the players. So, and, and the entire premise of the story that we're playing is that the players in that episode zero found this amulet and the amulet is actually a, a conduit to another dimension, a dimension for people called the watchers of the time stream. 
So this is literally a conduit to the viewers at home. And so they can talk to them through this magical amulet and a lot of the things, a lot of the chaos that comes to their world, good things, bad things, chaotic things are coming directly from these watchers of the time stream who are watching over them. That so is, interesting. I, I would love that as a player, would love it as an audience member. I think it would be my worst nightmare <laughs> as a dungeon master. You're not wrong. <laughs> like, throwing in all these wrenches into my story. Like, oh, no. yes. It's no. wild. It is wild. There's been many, many times where th there's another great example in an episode where I had a character die and there was a card that allowed the player to prevent that from happening. Mm. So literally a <laughs> character that an NPC that I had dead, <laughs> it was a pretty significant NPC lived on. And so it was like, no, you don't get to do that because the audience decided, no, you don't get to do that. Uh, wow. it, it, so I, I, like I said, I started the process thinking, ah, oh, my beautiful plans, but I've come to love the fact that it's another player at the table. It's this like sixth player, but also a sixth player that has the benefit of the wisdom of the crowds. You know, it, it, it is the group think of the entire audience that comes up with these incredible ideas that I would never have come to. I love yeah, all that because that it does so cool. really just make it feel like, like you said, like they're another collaborator at the table. Um, yeah. And I don't think, you know, other, other, you know, we've experimented with doing like mechanical things or just like, oh, you get a plus one bonus if someone donates money. And when we've done our extra life streams, it seems like that. And that's, that can be super fun and it makes it, but it doesn't have that kind of investment that I think your audience now has because they feel like they've been creating it with you. And it's this yeah. idea of, um, you know, collaborative storytelling that D&D &D is all about and then just expanding that circle so that it is audience as well. And sometimes, you know, there's the illusion of that happening in some passive media, you know, like I'm right. thinking of like, you know, the Star Trek famous uh, letter writing campaign to get Star Trek back on the air. And right. Things like that where you, oh, I have this illusion that I'm in control over this medium that I love, but you guys are shattering. It's not an illusion. You literally have a stake at that table and are able to do it. And I think that's a, a much smarter way to do it is with these storytelling things rather than, you know, you have now have a plus one dagger. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, it, it, I think all the things you said are correct. And I, I love that perspective on it. And I'm, I'm grateful you said that. It, it, does, it does break your brain a little bit sometimes of like <laughs> the yeah. breadth of things that can happen um, that, I, that I can't possibly foresee. But I, like I said, I've kind of fallen in love with this sort of just leaping into the void and trusting the players to be awesome, trusting that we will find our way through it and find something. Um, and and I, I keep being blown away by the choices that are made and the ideas that, that show up that ultimately become some of the best moments. Some of the best moments in the entire show are moments that I really had very little to do with because it, it just, this, this serendipity that happened between a great viewer idea and a great player idea and the right moment. When I, and it's funny that Shelly, you were like, oh, I don't think, you know, but there's the, some DMs have that, like, I'm presenting a story to you and you just need to take it. And I think, you know, maybe you had that idea early on and that's why you were reluctant to en and, and enjoy this much input. Right. Um, but I think that is such a nice, cool way to be now, right? Where you're like, I can, it doesn't matter where these ideas come from. You as a dungeon master is the instrument through which this story gets told rather right. than having to be like this top down, I am the storyteller and you must experience yeah. it the way I yeah. want you to. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically like getting suggestions, you know, if you're doing an improv show, if anybody's yeah. ever seen an improv show, you get suggestions from an audience, you know, like, well, give me a location or whatever. It, it's like getting that from all kinds of wonderful sources. You know, I'm getting suggestions from my players because they come up with things like that I would never have thought of to do for them. And then you get also these suggestions from the audience that just make the story richer and more interesting. And like I said, now we're nine episodes into this story that would never have happened, but for some audience members to think it into existence and just inspire me and the players and the, and the story itself. Have you seen, yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm keep asking questions. Go ahead, Shelly. No, I was just going to say like a lot of, I mean, as the dungeon master, you will be surprised as you don't always know what the players are going to do but you do know a lot of the story you know the big hooks and all so i guess it is a to keep you 
surprised. Yeah. As well. So that's cool. Yeah. I mean, there's been moments where I've been moved to tears by things that happened in the context of the game that came from a card. Someone pulls a card and says the card. And because there's magic in Dungeons and Dragons, you know, <laughs> that the card came out at this the perfect time for the card to come out. Like, there's no way we could have possibly predicted it. There's no way we could, we could have planted it. In it, it. But that card appearing in that moment and words that were not written by me, read out loud in this story, it's like, I, sometimes I get moved by that just because it's it, there is something wonderful about this thing we're all participating in, you know, that, yeah. that's, that this stuff happens. It's cool. I love it. I love it. You too. Yeah. Well, what now I feel question? like jazzed up and inspired. Good. Yes. Uh, hopefully everybody's listening. If you're not already paying attention to what's going on uh, on the Dungeon Run, you can now. Uh, Jeff mentioned it's on Caffeine uh, every Wednesday night. Uh, what time yep. does it start? Uh, Caffeine.tv slash the Dungeon Run, 6 p.m. Pacific time uh, every Wednesday night. But also you can listen to it as an audio podcast. Uh, wherever you get podcasts, you can search for the Dungeon oh, Run. Oh, that's cool. And it's on YouTube. So uh, all the visual stuff, all the episodes we have uh, are chronicled on YouTube. And, um, you know, you can catch up on all the, see all the cool models that we had in the past and the, and the fun virtual stuff we're doing now is it's all on YouTube, all as an audio podcast and uh, live every Wednesday night. You Does no the mind player have a name? The what? Do have a name? The mind Model? player? Oh, yes. It's Lord Araban. Oh, that's right, right. He is Araban. the keeper of secrets. And the amulet that the team found is the secret keeper's amulet. So there's some interesting oh. backstory there that is also, you know. Oh, that's, that's cool. He's wonderful involved. Wonderful meta thing. Too. Yeah. I love, like, when he talks, the way his tentacles move. Like, it's kind, it's like part hypnotizing, but also kind of disgusting. <laughs> that's what we're going for with yeah. the show is. <laughs> it's like kind of disgusting, soothing, but also like, <laughs> uh, I kind of want to throw up. There he is. He's right there. That's, that's our mind player friend. Oh, there that's so go. good. Change the light. Change the light. That's amazing. Uh, Alexa. Alexa, set mind flare to purple. See, I've got my own animatronic thing happening here. Oh, yeah, you do. Right. Yeah. High tech, high tech. That's incredible. I love yeah. it. I'm wor I'm working on it. One day I'll get to to, to dungeon run level. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty close. Okay, awesome. last question. No, two questions. Is do you like Harry Washington? We do I like Harry Washington? I will tell you. She you can answer if you liked her. <laughs> what did you say? Do, do I like her? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought she was. I thought she was very professional, very fantastic, very sweet person. Uh, that set was run with military precision and it all came from her. She, they had a thing called um, scandal fast, which is how fast you're supposed to say the lines of dialogue. Like most, most shows, you know, you've heard fa uh, uh, louder, faster, funnier, you know, as a, the direction that a lot of people give, you, you want to see your dialogue quickly. Uh, they, they talk about being scandal fast, which is like, really fast uh and luckily i didn't have uh, uh you know the monologues but the one of the guest stars that was on the same episode i was on had this monologue and they kept telling him you got to do it scandal fast man you got to it's got to be like twice as fast really? as you're doing it yeah that's funny because i feel like a lot of times when olivia pope was speaking like she would often speak like slowly and then really? immediately speed up again and i find <laughs> myself a lot because Olivia Pope left a mark on me that like, with, with the child, when I am like in like full mom mode, yeah. I like, I pope out on him. I am like, you need to go do the thing that I, I need told to, you to do right now. I think I need to pope out more on my kids. I think I need to pope out. You gotta watch some episodes, let Olivia wash over you and drink it'll change wine. your parenting. <laughs> eat some popcorn. Drink some wine. White some dresses. Popcorn. Are you wearing a lot of white dresses? <laughs> Wear a white Not nearly pink. enough. Not nearly <laughs> enough. <laughs> off white is good too uh that's you know i don't know many people who know carrie washington so i had to ask <laughs> i'm sure she, and I'm sure she does not remember me at all but it's okay <laughs> she, might, she might be a fan of, of dungeon run you know what carrie if you're watching thanks for watching i yeah. appreciate it i'll try thanks, to go carrie. faster uh as, as we do the show handle fast <laughs> scandal fast. Scandal fast i'm gonna yeah. start using that too <laughs> thank you so Clean much your room, Jeff, uh, for joining uh talking through this all that you've done for uh for dungeon run and as, you know as we were saying earlier about how the 
um, you know, the, the, the D and D nerdy mind share is everywhere. And yeah. you know, you're a big part of it by just being awesome and telling these great stories. So, well, thanks. Yeah. It's my pleasure. And I, you know, I'm a fan of what you guys are doing. I, I love the podcast and, um, it just, we're so delighted to be able to play this game in front of an audience. I, I apologize for the power outage. I hope that didn't disrupt too much, but I, I am uh, so grateful that kind of cool. got to, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it was like a card from uh, from the watchers yeah. of the time stream. The audience, and by the audience, I mean LADWP decided. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta Here's go a with cliffhanger. It. Awesome. Well, you're the best. Everyone check out uh, uh, Dungeon Run if you haven't already. And uh, God, I'm going to start listening to it on a podcast form. I think. I know. I, I don't know. I didn't. It works really well that way, I think. I, I love it. It feels like listening to an audiobook. So, yeah. Awesome. Did we talk about where people can find you? I don't remember. We did. We did. Oh. Never mind. We cut, there. we cut it out now. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, we are going to uh, take a break here now and uh, bring on Kate Welch to do a random character generator segment. It should be lots of fun. Yay, okay. Thanks, Shelley, for co-hosting with me. And thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. you are thank you both. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. That Appreciate was so it. fun. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll take do a break it again. now. Bye. <laughs> Hello, welcome Kate Welch to another segment of Random Character Generator. Yay! <sighs> yes. This is us, the, the, the cheering in the studio is one thing that I really do miss. That that Ryan Mars like, yeah! yeah. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Gotta provide that on our own. Shelly and I have been trying to recreate it as best we can, and I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm happy you are here for it. And we're like, you're awesome, Kate. You're so Extremely cool. Here for it. <laughs> I want to be like Kate when I grow up. Oh, oh that's so nice. Oh, is, that, is that Greg Tito's daughter saying that? That's what they said, yeah. <laughs> in the background, clapping all over the place. Uh, but this is the segment where we just applaud each other, and that's it. That's all we do. Uh, yeah. No, we make up a random character on D&D Beyond, uh, yes. third level. Uh, we so hit that, that randomized button. And we don't know what it's going to be like, but we like to devise a character backstory based on all the random choices that the electronic AIs put together. And I can't wait. So let us uh, get to it. And I think I can that. actually do this. Give me the link. In, I got to do, I actually got to do it. I haven't, I, I, I need to click some buttons here. All right. Um, I'll vamp. Yeah. Vamp for you. Hey, what's the deal with, um, with face masks fogging up your glasses? What Dude, is this? San Francisco? A lot. You don't wear glasses? But when I wear sunglasses, it happens. Oh, man. The I, the idea of you wearing sunglasses and a mask, that's too cool for school. Oh, that's man. A, that's a Mr. Cool guy right there. It's a, it's a move I do way too often. <laughs> and then I'm like, I can't see. So then I like bumble around into things. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, you know, it's... one thing I do like about this, this particular moment in time is uh, how anything goes. <laughs> I just saw I saw a wonderful video just now that my friend Tristan sent me, which was that that like um, that right before the drum solo in um, in the air tonight, he goes the stranger to you and me, and she goes she she falls face down down the stairs, <laughs> and I was like yes, this is the content the BS that I'm here for. Ooh, all right. I, oh, look at me. I, got I know, I know. I just switched off, uh, but I'll get you the link. Um, and... Oh, no, I'm, I'm looking at, I am currently on Twitch. I am you. Oh, they yes, fixed it. I, I was you and also half of myself, which, which matches up. I appreciated the vamping. <laughs> I appreciate the vamping because I'm still like, oh, no, I got to do this. <laughs> Uh, but we'll make oh, is it that happen. you messing up? Nice work. It's bro. me. I'm trying to do this while <laughs> hosting at the same time, and it is. Super Dude, you're doing easy. it live. This is good. This I know. Is great. Right? All right, I'm just gonna yes. drop it in the chat so uh, you can see it. Um, All right. And then it also Sounds people good. are seeing that right now. And then I'm gonna work on getting your frames working. Oh yeah, get uh, those frames working. All right. While you do that, I'm gonna read to them what we've got. The the randomization, but oh yeah. All right. Oh, this is. <laughs> I know it's already good. A this is point. really bad. Okay, so let me let me introduce you guys. We set the scene. What do we got here? We've got. Uh, imagine, if you will, a um, uh, a hut in the midst of um of a, a bog. Like from far as the eye can see, is just scrubby grass. 
and and the occasional puddle. Um, and there's there there are these little, uh, let's say round huts every so often that that sort of boil up out of the shrubbery. And from one of these huts emerges, the, the door opens, a cloud of incense smoke comes pouring out. And with, with bones and wood pieces around her neck, rattling in the wind, she comes out, she, she lifts her head, she sniffs. And yes, yes, that's right, it's Nethwir. Nethwir, Nethwir, Nethwir. Nethwir, yeah. Nethwire, 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 uh, a lizard folk druid covered head to toe in the in the bones and the dried newts and uh, and the, the leaves, and she she has come out this morning early early that the 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 fog from Greg Tito's sunglasses hasn't even yet evaporated <laughs> off of the vast the vast tundra around her. Whoosh! All right. I, I'm feeling that we're now uh, yeah. from all of that description. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Boy, howdy. She's proficient in a lot of weapons though. Look at that. Yes. Okay. So she can wield, she's got the following proficiencies, club, dagger, dart, javelin, mace, quarterstaff, scimitar, sickle, sling, and spear. That might just be druids. In which it case druids, druids are, druids are super OP. That's a lot of weapon proficiencies. Well, they, you know, usually does like simple or, or uh, what's the other word? Warfare you know, the martial weapons. Uh, maybe that's a fourth edition thing, but you, you know, say that's a 12th edition thing. 12th edition. We're working on 12th edition. right now. We're, <laughs> we're like Microsoft where we just like double it, cut it in half and double it. Um, <sighs> but Neth, we are, look at those, uh, stats. Nothing that's, too good. Nothing great going on here. She's got negative one dexterity. So yeah. maybe how, how does that, how does that figure into a lizard? Lizard folk are pretty gangly usually, right. and and more dexterous. So maybe she's, maybe she's got. Oh, she's old. She has arthritis. She's an she's an old druid. Ooh. Um. She's charismatic. She's got her. She <laughs> she doesn't have any specializations in charisma, which is fine. So she's just sort of generally charismatic. People she like can her. Be, she can be persuasive if the moment calls for it. She can be intimidating. She'd be charming. She'd be deceptive, but nothing. She's not super great at any of those. <laughs> Just sort of equally good at them across the board. Yeah, that's so great. Uh, she's right. got uh, druid features uh, and traits. What's her circle? Circle spells. I'm not seeing hmm. uh, what her uh, class features are. Let's go to that. Yeah. Druid circle is circle of the land with mountain as the land type for Nethwir. Okay. So it's a swamp in the mountains. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you asked. As it happens, these mountains, ha, they have sort of a, an area, you, usually mountains, we think of them as spiky. But the, these mountains have sort of a, a, a large area of plateau. So for instance, I'm thinking of the, like the Alaskan tundra. Oh, okay technically way up in the mountains, very high elevation. But when you're in the tundra, the, the tree growth doesn't, the trees don't grow past a certain altitude. So you can see the altitude line. And beyond that, it's just scrubby grass, rivers, ravines, a lot of grizzly bears. That's, this is the, she's in a sort of a mountain swamp. All right. That's, mountain it's, swamps are a thing. It's Dungeons and Dragons. It's a thing. It's a thing. Um, I, I like that because there is uh, this contrast between, you know, uh, being moist a lot while also being in something that's very cold, uh, usually Ooh. in higher ele elevation. So, you know, maybe yeah. that's why her, she, her arthritis is so bad. Oh, maybe so. Maybe so. And it's, it's probably also not great. Maybe it, it could be arthritis. Maybe she's not even that old, mm. but she has arthritis because the lizard folk is cold blooded. And so as a result, like she just, she just doesn't have a lot of energy. I assume lizard folk are cold blooded. It's, D it's D sure. We can just it's say D &D. that. Um, and uh, so she doesn't have a lot of energy to move. So she tends to conserve her energy hmm. uh, and, and not, not bust out with a lot of, uh, a lot of acrobatics. Right. Uh, she she's does a sage though. Her background is sage. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see. So she's got the feature researcher, uh, which means she can uh, kind of, recall a piece of lore 
uh, much e more easily. Yeah, she's also got hunter's lore um, with, so it means profession, proficiency with perception and nature are the ones that she has. So she's, um, she's a book nerd, mm. right? She's a, she's a, she's the learned one. She might not even be someone who would, you would think would be learned. She speaks a lot of languages. She's got common yes. draconic druidic halfling and under common. So I'm guessing, although she's only third level, Nethwar has been on a lot of adventures already. Hmm. Maybe this is like retirement for her. Maybe, or maybe she used to be an adventurer, but then she took an arrow in the knee and has decided to become a, a sort of a, a little, uh, a, a mountain swamp druid in this tundra as, hmm. as, as a part of her retirement. Does her connection to that land mean that she's a current resident of that land? Uh, like maybe that could just be where her homeland was and she's been uh, taken away to, you know, I mean, under Kamen might mean that she's, you know, been in the Underdark for a long time and learned Ooh, that. Interesting. Uh, or, you know, fell into a, a ravine uh, and is somehow trying to get back to her mountain swamp. Interesting. Okay, so she's not currently at home. I mean, the she could be. That, the scene that I set for you is, is relevant. What if she, it's it's unusual for lizard folk to be this, this far inland such that they would live in the mountains. Mm. So either they're a very specific, strange class of lizard folk or they're hiding from something. Yeah. I wonder if, since she speaks under common and she does, she does have some really interesting, like the, the, her lizard folk abilities are all about biting. She's got, uh, she's got her bite as one of her melee attacks. And then also once per short rest as a bonus action, she can make a bite attack. And if it hits, she gains one temporary HP from that hungry jaws feature. So that's pretty cool. Hungry jaws. I'm wondering if she was kidnapped when she was young by a raiding party of drow. Ooh, okay. Uh, because she speaks under common, it seems like she would have spent some time in the Underdark. I wonder if it was like uh, like cockfighting or dogfighting. They mm. would capture these lizard folk and use them to fight in in arenas in the Underdark, and you know make bets. And it was also this whole gladiatorial sport. And so when when she was young, she learned under common because of that. Okay. And she, she was, she was, um, she's, she's got proficiency with all these weapons. So I know, I know that's probably part of the Druid class feature, but just, just storytelling. Yeah. What if like every time she was in a match, they gave her a different weapon to fight with as, cause that's part of the, the meta of lizard folk fighting. And so she became proficient with all of these weapons in the fighting pits, including being unarmed that, that that advantage that she gets from the hungry jaws ability, being able to just bite her opponent and get one temporary HP. Like there were times when she, she snatched victory just from a lucky bite. You know, she was a, she was a champion in those fighting rings, awesome. but she was a slave, you know? Right. And then she was trying to stay learned this whole time. Like she was uh, a sage. So she needed to uh, like some of maybe her, her most prized possessions were the few amounts of, I don't want to say books, but what do you think? What do you think she would have read? You know, scrolls well, or parchment or or sc scrolls. It's possible. Let's see. She could have had. There could have been someone else in the fighting pits, either another slave that took care of her or another fighter mm. that had um, that was able to secret away uh, scrolls, parchments, those kinds of things and maybe taught her to write and read in, in Undercommon. I'm imagining like a little halfling fighter because she also speaks halfling, right? Yeah. So maybe maybe this is, uh, maybe this was something that the halfling companion of hers taught her in those fighting pits. Makes sense. It um, makes as much sense as anything. For sure. No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so she's got wild shape. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. What do you think would be her? Oh, man. Her, uh, I mean, she's only third level, so she can't do uh, anything that has uh, a flying speed or anything like that. So Right. Max uh, CR one quarter, one fourth. Right. So those are usually like wolves, uh, 
small mammals? Uh, I don't know. Or does she use it at all? Maybe she just knows that she can, and but she's been taught not to do that. Or maybe that's the the fighting technique is also one of the things that she falls back on. Oh, sure. So this would be this would be a creature that would have some kind of um, some kind of fighting ability. So a wolf, a wolf is a good one. A bear. I don't I don't have the the monsters in front of me for the the CR one fourth, but I know that all the all the j- most of the generic monsters at the back of the monster manual are the ones that you can you can kind of shape shift into at, at right. one fourth. Um, but yeah, something. Yeah, I, I think I think something that would have aided her in the fighting pits would would be the one that she would take. But I'm definitely open to suggestions on that. I mean, I like I like the wolf as an example um, okay. because wolf it, it feels yeah. like the jaw, the hungry jaws. Like I can really kind of envision, or maybe a dog, uh, or or like a German Shepherd type type of uh, creature, um, because of you know the ability to of. of uh, just clamping down and biting feels like something that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. How about a mastiff? That's only Ooh. challenge rating one eighth. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, but mastiffs are guard dogs, hunting dogs, war dogs, small humanoids ride them as mounts. Mm-hmm. Ooh, ooh. So Ooh-hoo. think about this. A small humanoid is a halfling, right? Oh, so maybe that was part of their, part of their appeal in the fighting pits was that they would fight as a duo and that uh, Nethwar would transform wild shape into a mastiff. Her halfling companion would jump on, and then they would ride around the ring as as a as a duo and and fight that way. She was Ooh. fearless, you know. Her those hungry jaws. She was she was uh, she was a natural in those yeah. fighting. Yeah, and I, and I like the idea of her pairing up with a halfling because that's such a a strange. You know, uh, strange circumstances make strange bedfellows, or whatever the phrase is, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> you know it, that it, common it, phrase. It, you know the common phrase. Um, <laughs> the the halfling would have taught her halfling how to speak halfling, right? Mm-hmm. And it would have been a pretty easy way to communicate secretly, so that the drow guards would not be able to understand them. So that's that's how that's how they communicated. Mm, okay. How do you think? How do you think she escaped? Yeah, that's what I was just trying to think of. And so I have this image of uh, her uh, changing into a dog and having her halfling companion, you know, ride, ride, away, ride out, you know, somehow yeah. from, from the Underdark and make their way, you know, almost out of the Abyss uh, adventure style, like, you know, clawing and surviving. She's got the ability as part of the cunning artisan uh, thing to create a shield and club and javelins and darts and things that she can use uh, as weapons when they can't find you know, the actual weapon. So I like, so light Ray, light Raya in the chat says, maybe you get freedom for winning enough. Well, that doesn't so sound very drow like, but it <laughs> doesn't sound very drow like, but maybe what happened was you don't get freedom. You don't get it like handed to you. You fight until you have the chance to escape and they give you a head start mm. before they start to chase you. Right. That, that sounds drow like that sounds like a drow thing. So yeah, you you get an hour and if you can figure your way out or hide well enough that drow raiding parties who have lived there their whole lives cannot find you then you are worthy of escape yeah. and once you reach the, once you reach the surface then you're fine but i think she would have had to have somebody on the in, on the inside like a dritz type character or maybe some flumps or maybe yeah. some flumps flumps in the underdark <laughs> Flux to the rescue! They save everybody down there. It's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, and I like, you know, she's she's not like super, super charismatic, but it is her highest stat. So I like that she was uh, a bit of a showman uh, with the, the fighting pits. And so maybe she was popular uh, amongst the drow, even though they, they uh, you know, might have yes. might have not been the best masters. Um, and so they wanted to give her this, this fighting chance a couple of times. And maybe sometimes they're like, all right, well, you didn't make it. And then on the third time, she, they, she and her halfling companion finally did, you know, uh, evade capture yes. and have been working their way trying to get uh, back to, to her home. Yeah, I think so. Do you think that her halfling companion is still with her? Or is this is this like something that she's she's looking for or trying to avenge? Or do, I, I like the idea that the halfling couldn't keep up at some point mm. and that the drow the drow caught the halfling and the halfling told Nethwar, like, get out of here. 
okay, yeah, I like that too. Uh, that that creates a lot of drama and tension, uh, yeah. and, and guilt in in her, in her character, perhaps, exactly. or perhaps not. You know, who knows? No, I think um, she's. I think she does feel guilty. Uh, we yeah. don't have an alignment on no, her. No, alignment never gets picked as part of the, right. the random thing. That. Uh, I do too, because I'm always like, well, what? How, you know, so we can assign whatever alignment we want. What do you think? You know, based on what we've been talking about, what do you think uh, it would be? Um, well, I do. I think that she has a, a great deal of regret, but also fear of going back. It hasn't been that long since her final escape was a success, but her halfling companion is still trapped in the Underdark. Mm -hmm. And maybe Nethwer just kept running and running and running until she got to this swamp and she finally felt she finally felt like they weren't chasing her anymore. They've been chasing her for so many years that it wasn't until she was like as far away from the Underdark as she could manage that she was able to like stop and take a breath and hit level three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now, now I think she is gathering the resources to be able to go back and rescue the halfling that essentially saved her life. Yeah. You know, more than once, literally in the arena, but also in that final escape. Um, I love that because that ties in with the sage feature of researcher. You know, yeah. once you pick the sage, you know, there's there's eight specialties that, that you can pick. And researcher was the one that was chosen for this. And so, you know, the 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 characters uh, in in the party, if anybody wants to use Nethwer, might meet her, say, at a candle keep or a library uh, mm. after she's had these in, in, in uh, adventures. And she's currently researching how to get back to uh, the Underdark to uh, to save her companion. Now, we keep saying companion. Well, should we name this halfling friend of hers? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. What's some good halfling names? I mean, I don't know any halflings out halfling there. Halfling names. They're just named like hobbits, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Let's see. Halfling Proud names. Feet. Proud feet. <laughs> um, what about... I know. It's, I, I put you on the spot as far as coming up with names. Corhorn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, winner, winner, Corhorn, uh, Corhorn. Corhorn, the halfling, Do you, and Nethweer, the druid. And Nethweer is is a, a female. I think we've kind of established that kind of quickly. Uh, what is Corhorn? Yeah. Is Corhorn? Cor Corhorn is that was a I just used a male halfling name generator. <laughs> so I think Corhorn's a, a guy. I think I think he's a male, um, and that he. He lost someone that that, that Nethwer is very unlikely as uh, someone to be adopted by halflings. But half, halflings are very adoptive. They they do tend to bring people into their families and mm -hmm. and be warm and 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 inviting. So I think that that Corhorn maybe in the in the raid that the Drow conducted on his village, he lost someone dear to him too. And so when Nethwer came in as this young lizard folk druid and she was putting up such a fierce fight in the pits, but she, you know, was, was clearly out of her elements and he, he couldn't help, he couldn't help but take pity on her and shared what little he had been able to acquire and smuggle. He's been down there for years, but until she came along, he didn't have the sense of performance, the sense of, of charisma. Mm -hmm. And it was their fighting duo with her as a mastiff and him riding because it's it's like um, I remember there was a scene like this in the in the Game of Thrones books where Tyrion is in a, a fighting pit and he's riding on pigs. Yeah. And it's it's supposed to be like, oh, look at this, you know, the imp on the pig. Ha ha ha. So I, I tend to think since Drow are evil, they would also find entertainment in like a little halfling riding on a big dog. And so they they are they were initially very charmed by it. They were like, "Ha ha! It's look at look at the, the spectacle of this." But eventually, they found out that these two made a damn good fighting duo as well. And watching Nethwer turn from lizard folk to massive and back was she just she got really good at it. She was able she was able to execute that at the right moments and and tumble out of out of disaster and and save uh, Cornhorn. <laughs> What was his name? Cor Corhorn. 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 Save Cornhorn from disaster from his own 
demise multiple times and, and Corhorn returned the favor as well. Except for that last time, which is which is why she wants to be able to to continue to exactly to, to uh, save him. Exactly. Uh, do you think yeah. there's any is, is there any romance or are you thinking this is uh, kind of a platonic uh, respect? I think that Corhorn has more of a paternal affection for her. Hmm. And because I, she is the, the more I think about her, the younger she's getting, she's, I think she's pretty young. She's, she's pretty naive, um, barely more than a hatchling as they would say in, in lizard folk culture. And Corhorn is a little bit older. And so he's taken her under his wing as a, as a little halfling daddy. So like yeah, it. he's, he sacrificed himself because he's like, I've lived a good life. I got to, I mean, not a great life, obviously. He's a slave in the fighting pits of the Underdark, but <laughs> he's like, I've, I've had my chance at this world. Get on, girl, get on out of here. And she's, and, and though she did, because she was terrified and, and didn't want to be there, she she knows that her destiny is going to take her back there to, to rescue him. Cool. Um, we didn't talk about her spells at all. Uh, at wills are uh, control flames, poison mm -hmm. spray, resistance. Uh, for some reason, yeah. she doesn't know any first level spells. I think that was just a, a glitch in the matrix here. But yeah, probably the spider climb uh, sounds spider interesting to me. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, spider climb is probably how she escaped. Right. Spider climb helped her get out. Yeah, and spike growth too. Like she was, she was able to transform the ground. It's the transformation of the ground is camouflaged to look natural. So she was able to um, to make to hide from drow raiding parties because. One of the things that I like to think canonically is that the drow, they're underground, they're they're around, you know, their their city, whether it's Menzo Berenson or or whatever, they know the stalactites and the stalagmites, mm. like someone would know the trees of the forest and the stones and the formations of mountains. That's right. their those are their natural landmarks. So she was able to confuse them and throw them off by creating spikes using spike growth to create new stalactites and stalagmites and so that they would get lost and then at the same time use oh. spider climb to evade them if they got close by climbing up the walls and on the ceilings. Excellent. And because her halfling companion might not have been able to spider climb, maybe that's how she got away. Uh, yeah. Leaving him and, oh, I like all this. Oof. All Oof. right. So uh, what, do, what do you think... Uh, Nethwer sounds like. How do you think you would uh, portray her voice? I think lizard folk. I would go with with a with a a, ras, a, a raspy kind of a this voice, Ooh. which I think is why that it's possible, at least in the the salt marsh context, people tend to mistrust the lizard folk because they sound sinister because of that snakiness. Yeah, but I think I think she's she's got she's got to. She's got a little bit of a lilt, but when she says her S's, they sound like this. And her voice is kind of quiet. She doesn't talk a lot. She, is, she tends to do more with her actions, especially being a, solitar a solitary creature now in yeah. her little druid hut. I think she reads more than she talks by a huge margin. But when she talks, it's soft. And it does. It has, it has that snake quality. I am going to find Cockmere. No, what's his name? Corn, corn, cornhole, corn. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> He's very good at that game where you throw bean bags onto oh, a board. Oh, super good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why they. It's how he got his name. He invented it. He invented it. <laughs> in, in, in Half Lake Sculptor, he is the inventor of cornhole. That's why he was such a valuable captive. <laughs> yes, exactly. They're like, oh, finally, cornhole's back to teach us this Wait, game. Wait, you're the about... cornhole. <laughs> <The world. laughs> all right awesome so uh to recap neth were we were is a uh lizard folk druid uh that uh her people lived on a uh swampy area you know, on a plateau in the mountains uh when she was young she fell into a cavern and uh was uh, surprised by a drow raiding party and uh, abducted taken into the underdark um she is uh, a fighter, uh, forced to fight. She befriended a, a halfling by the name of Cornhole. Uh, the two of them became a a popular duo because of their their high charisma, or maybe because of Nethwer's uh, uh, showmanship in all the things. So they were given extra privileges. One of which was to uh, be 
uh, released and then have the drow hunt them down. Mm -hmm. But on one of these parties, uh, she used her spike growth to um, uh, evade capture and use spider climb that she maybe she recently went from level two to level three. So she got these spells uh, and uh, escaped through her own uh, courage up to the surface, leaving behind her companion. Um, and now she is researching as much as she can about the Underdark and the Drow to organize an expedition to go and save her long lost father figure, halfling, uh, the inventor of a, a popular game. <laughs> <laughs> she has to save him because who knows what other games he could invent? You know, it's 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 of deep importance. He could he could learn cribbage. Uh, <laughs> they call him <laughs> Cornhole Cribbage. Uh, Proud Feet is his, his family name. Corn Cornbidge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I love this character. As I do I all her. of these characters. Uh, so oh, she's fun. She's so cool. Yeah, uh, I am going to leave a. Uh, Actually, I guess I can do it in the Twitch chat before I, I, I sign off so you guys can see that. But then we often post these up with the uh, episode when we go live. Uh, feel free to use this character. And as I was saying uh, in uh, the intro with Shelly, I'd love to see more folks um, uh, tell me stories of using some of these as NPCs in your game if you are so inspired to do so. I think that's yes, just a really, really fun thing. Uh, awesome. Well, thanks, Kate. Yeah, uh, thank you, Greg. For coming on. I love making up uh, these fun characters together. It's my pleasure. It's my great honor. Thank you so much. Uh, if people want to ask you questions about uh, Neth Weir and any of our characters, uh, what's the best way to do that? You can find me on Instagram at kwellchachachacha. I swear, I think that's too many H's. It's four H's. I'm also been, I've also been doing a Twitch live streams, so you can follow me here on Twitch. Same name, kwellchachachacha, four H's. And nice. um, we can chat. We can chat about Neth Weir. We can chat about not Neth Weir. Fine by me. What about you, Greg? Where can the nice folks find you? I'm at Greg Tito on the Twitters and Greg underscore uh, Tito on Instagram. Um, and I look forward to hearing people uh, create characters that invented mundane games in our in our world <laughs> going forward. <laughs> it's a very meta thing that makes me happy for some strange reason. <laughs> it's the little things that count right now. <laughs> it really is. It really is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back with some more fun segments next week. We did it, Kate. We did it. We, we did it. Oh, nice. Ah. Nice. All right. Um, I forgot to tell everybody when we were doing the actual recording, we are talking to someone really awesome uh, next week for Dragon Talk. Noelle Stevenson, the <gasps> showrunner of She-Ra, Princess oh, of Power. Oh, shit. Are you serious? Yeah. And the fifth season just dropped today. Uh, wow. I believe uh, fifth so, season. I know that's what I'm like. I'm still on season one. Uh, I gotta oh catch gosh. up. But yeah, no, I think it's the fifth and final season that she's mm. she's running. Uh, that's awesome. Is now awesome. live oh, on I'm Netflix so right I'm now. I'm gonna have to watch that. Yeah, and we've we've spoken to uh, her her uh, wife uh, Molly Ostertag, and as she had great stories. Uh, so I can't wait to uh, to to hear from Noel, and and uh, you can look for that interview next week uh, at one p.m. on Friday. Sweet. All right. Uh, Binwin's Plays is up next. Woohoo! Watch all that fun stuff. And then uh, Tales from the Mist is this evening. And I believe there is a Rivals of Waterdeep one shot this weekend, uh, as well as lots Ooh. of fun stuff uh, coming on twitch.tv slash dnd forever. <laughs> there, there's more and more content coming. <laughs> Try and stop us. It's going to be a 24 hour block of nonstop uh, UHF like Don't lie. Programming. Don't lie. <laughs> don't, do you, go, don't, don't, don't write checks your ass can't cash I know right I'm trying <laughs> when we were I don't know if you even knew this Kate but when we were starting up this this whole Twitch kind of thing for D&D the code name was Wheel of Fish because we were Wheel of Fish <laughs> Red Snapper Red Snapper very thing <laughs> they fish <laughs> that was like that was a, a holy text in my household my father and I watched UHF Hundred thousand times, I think, probably. Nature suction cups. <laughs> <laughs> Did you happen you to UHF the Weird Al movie? Everyone, that's your homework for this weekend. Find it's it, so watch good. it. It you holds up, it. even though it's about like you know uh, cable television and, oh and all God. that. You know, uh, but it's 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 really really good. I watched it like <sighs> last year. It's fantastic. But I want to ask you, as a Weird Al fan, did you see 
this week he uh, released a video where it's some of the folks from Mr. Show as well as comedians singing uh, lyrics from Eat It. Uh, no! In, in one of their like mashup type of things. It made me so happy. Oh my God. All right. We have to end this call so I can go watch that. Go watch it. It's amazing. I will. All I right. will. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we shall be back next week with some even more fun 